but it's good. Okay. That's why I shared here. <laughs> so he woke up in the middle of the night, and he was shouting, egg, as in dan, as in egg. I spoke last week that he liked those, you know those kinder eggs that you buy in the shop? Those chocolate wraps, then there's inside, there's a little toy inside. So for some reason, he, he, I don't know how he fell in love with those eggs. So he really liked those eggs. And so sometimes when we're out in the shopping center, we go to the shop, and we buy him egg. And he always said, egg, I want to buy egg. He said, my egg, he said. So a few nights ago, in the middle of the night, he woke up and said, egg. He, he was sitting on, on his bed, and he was kind of crying. And he didn't, he didn't look too happy when he was up. He was shouting, egg. Then I don't know what to do in the middle of the night. I thought that he won an egg or something like that. Then he said, book. Then I said, what? Egg and book. And then he went back to egg again, and he was kind of crying a little bit, and he was sitting on the bed. So I thought that he won to read book in the middle of the night, or he won a chocolate egg in the middle of the night. So I, I wasn't too sure, so I don't know what to do. I was, I was, I'm, I'm kind of confused. Like, what, what do you want in the middle of the night, sitting on the bed? Then he kind of just uh, collapsed and fell on his bed again and sleep again. Then I discovered that he was making a dream. He was making a, he was making a bad dream. And in the dream, it's, it's roughly like this. He's looking for an egg from possibly me or Amy. And we wouldn't give it to him. So he kind of woke up and he said, I want egg. He was kind of requesting that he won an egg. So he was making a bad dream. Because he wants something so bad, this thing actually appeared in his dream. Sometimes we are like that when we are Christian. If we want something really, really bad, and we are not too sure whether will God give it to us, you dream about it. And as a Christian, we want a lot of things. We want a lot of things from God, we, lot, we want a lot of things. There, there's a lot of want in our minds. So the last time I shared about Psalms 23, we talk about the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Have we scriptures? So the Lord is my shepherd. Oh, here we go, we have it. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The last time I talked about the Lord is my shepherd. And if we acknowledge and if we accept it, that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. That means that as a Christian, we have very little want as a result of this passage. If we, if we acknowledge the Lord is our shepherd, our need is very limited. Some of the questions I ask from the last time is, is it possible that we have misunderstood this passage or have we placed the incorrect focus in this passage? We have always turned into this passage, Psalms 23, especially when we look at Psalms 23, 4. We think about that if we want something, if we're in trouble or if we want some need, and if we go to God, and God will comfort me. And God will somehow supply my need and satisfy me. In Psalms 23, 2, 3, and 4, it actually said that. But the focus may not be 2, 3, and 4. The focus is 1, that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in need. If we only associate Psalms 23 in times of troubles and difficulties, we have placed the incorrect focus of this psalm. <clears throat> so what we learned the last time is we have to shift the way we think. The important bit is 23.1, the Lord is my shepherd. And if we have acknowledged that, I shall not be in want. This is very important. We, we have to transform this way of thinking that every time we need something, we go to God. This is true, that God will supply. But the focus is not this. The focus is the Lord is my shepherd into a God-centered viewpoint that confronts our normal ways of thinking. What is this normal way of thinking? This normal way of thinking is Christians always demand and request God to fulfill our needs. Driven by greed, 
other than need. Psalms 23 is saying that God is our essence for life. The main point is 23.1. The Lord is my shepherd. I said that many times. Our need will be met as he leads. The very important point is when we allow God to lead us, our needs will be met, but not the other way. It's not driven by you that when I want something, then when I go to God, he will satisfy me. I have discovered that <clears throat> as long as a two-year-old boy, when they want something, they kept thinking about something to the point that they dream about it. As long as my son stays with me, as long as he stays within my care and my love, I will give him all the best thing I could. As a father myself, I will give him all the good things. I don't just give him chocolates. I give him Max and Spencer Philly sticks. I give him broccoli, all the healthy stuff, even though he may not think they're healthy. God is like that sometimes when we are requesting for an egg, and a chocolate egg, then we are crying, and we are dreaming, and we woke up in the middle of the night, God, I want that egg. But God is saying, the son, I'm going to give you Max and Spencer Philly stick. I'm, I'm going to give you all the good stuff. I will buy you fresh broccoli. I will give you salmon. I will give you good stuff that will make you grow, that will make you happy, that will make you grow into a healthy person, not just from eating all those junk, growing fat in your belly. I will give you stuff that can grow your muscles, grow your bones, and make you into a healthy being. But sometimes we do not think like that. When we go to God and say, God, give me all those chunks. <laughs> give me crisps. Give me chocolate. Give me Diet Coke. Not Diet Coke, Fat Coke. Give me everything. <laughs> well, Psalm 23 does not mean that God takes care of us by giving us everything we demand. This is very important. Psalms 23 does not mean that God is looking after us by giving us everything we demand. This is very important. But instead, those people who trust in the Lord, just as a sheep trusting a shepherd, will never lack anything they need. This is extremely important. <coughs> I have learned from Daniel as well. When we go to the shopping center, right? You want to buy that egg, which is only like one euro or 119, or in Dunn store, two euro for three, which is a lot cheaper. So, a lot of the time, I avoid to buy that egg in the news agent because it's costing 149. Two minutes away, Dunn store, two euro for three, <laughs> which is about 66 to 67 cents each, which is roughly half price. So, most of the time, I try to avoid to go into that shop because for the price of one egg in the shop, I can almost buy three eggs in one store. So as a parent, you always go for the cheaper option. You don't always buy the most expensive things, which is the same egg. There's no difference at all. One is a news agent. One is in one store, but it's two or three minutes away. But as a child, two or three minutes away is eternity. He can't wait for two or three minutes. He can't even wait for 20 seconds. So when he wants to go into the shop, he said, Daddy, buy egg. Thank you and please. He say all these words again. Please and thank you. Daddy, buy egg. Daddy, egg. When I say, wait a minute, we go to the gun store, we buy egg, right? Okay. <laughs> because two euro for three, not 149 each. Then he said, Daddy, egg. Daddy, I want egg. Daddy, egg. Daddy, buy egg. He repeated probably 20 or 30 times around the news agent. And he, and he wouldn't continue walking until I go into that shop and buy that 149 egg. So he said, Daddy, I want egg. Egg. Then he said, yeah, Daddy, I want egg. Daddy, I want egg. Then he start to get annoyed because he thought that I'm not buying him that egg. Well, I am buying him that egg. I have a lot of coins in, in my pocket. I have like 20 or 30 euro. I can buy you loads of eggs, but in Dunn's store, not in the news agent. So what happened there is he start to get mad. He start to cry. And he start to get cranky. And what I discover is, Daniel, walk with daddy. We're going to buy egg in that shop. And he refused to obey my order. He refused to follow my instruction. Sometimes I discover that when we want something really bad, we refuse and we disobey God's instruction, just like my son. But me and you is exactly the same. When you want something really bad, and when that something occupies your mind already, and when God is guiding you and leading you, you're not going to listen to him. You rather disobey him. You, are, you rather refuse his command and his instruction. 
and you kind of wander around in the same spot, and you wouldn't go forward. Even though, even though God said, I'm going to guide you into something else, I'm going to guide you into somewhere else, but you have refused to listen to God. We have disobeyed God many, many times as a result. If we always do this as a Christian, this is getting us nowhere. There's different levels of faith. To some sense, one level of faith is based on God supplying us when you think you have something in need. For example, when you need something, or when you think you are weak, you need the power of the Holy Spirit, or when exams is coming up, or when something is very important is coming up in your life, maybe in an interview or something like that, then you pray to God. You pray to God, God, I pray for power. I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit, that I can go to this interview. I pray for peace. I pray for whatever that I need so that I can finish this task. I can, I can finish this interview, or I can finish this project, or whatever difficulties you're facing. You're using Psalm 23, 2, 3, and 4 to pray, Lord, even though I walk through the, 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 de the valley of the death, you're with me. Your staff and your rod, they comfort me. So we use Psalms 23, 2, 3, and 4 to pray when we have needs and difficulties. And sometimes God answers our prayer because this is, an, this is a legitimate this is a godly prayer. This is a prayer, this is a prayer a Christian should, should be making. I'm not saying this is, this is wrong. But to rise your faith to another level, your faith should be based on Him and based on God and based on who God is, based on your understanding of God. Even though He gave it to you or not, you still trust in Him. No matter whether you think you are in need or not, or no matter whether you think you are insufficient or sufficient in your life, because of Psalms 23.1, you can proclaim in your prayer that God, I am, already, I am already sufficient. I am already happy. Your faith, as a result, it generates a comfort in your spirit from the Holy Spirit. It generates a power that you know that you are sufficient right here and right now. Despite whatever circumstance you are facing, before or after the interview, it doesn't really matter. Because you know that this God of yours is with you. He is your shepherd. You shall not be in want. Even before you go into dealing with some difficulties, your faith rises to another level. And as a result, it generates a security. It generates a power that you know God is here, right here and right now. And I am sufficient right here and right now. In the past years, I've been facing a lot of difficulties, especially financially. Because, you know, two years ago, one of our restaurants was burned down by mistake. And the other one in Castle Rock is not doing too good. Then this one in Contaf, and I'm looking after the one in Contaf. And business is not going as good as before. It's different when you own a restaurant now. That cash doesn't come in naturally. Where before, they just can't stop flowing in. That owners of restaurants, they don't really need to work. They just go back for a walk, make sure nothing, nothing bad happens, and they just can get to go home or they can just watch telly and relax and do whatever you like. But only a restaurant now is totally different from the past. You have to do everything yourself because business is very tight. So in the past two or three years, all the finance is quite tight. And I was thinking, that how am I going to supp supply my family? In about a year to 18 months, I earn less than what I need to spend. I, I, I overspend for about 18 months because things are not good. And I already, I already kind of spending tightly that don't buy unnecessary stuff and things like that. I, I haven't been buying anything for myself for the past probably 12 or 16 months. I didn't buy stuff for myself for a long time. Every week or every month when I receive salaries, I always do a few things. The first thing is pay for Daniel's crash first because he need to go to school. Then I go to the supermarket, buy him all the good stuff I can afford. Then I, I normally forgot my own lunch and dinner. <laughs> I sometimes just go to Subway and get a roll, or go to spa, get a 2.95 chicken fillet roll, <laughs> 2.95 with a can of Coke. I, I always forget about myself. And so things are tight. And I was thinking and worrying that how am I going to sustain this family? And for 18 months, I have been thinking, what should I do? And because I obviously I overspent already, and well, I'm, I'm spending very wisely, but I still overspent. So I was driving one night, I was meditating on God's word, and I was worshiping. 
And this verse just come to me, Psalm 23, 1. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. And God is telling me at that moment, he's saying that, oh, because I'm with you, you are sufficient right now. Do not think that you are insufficient because you are sufficient right now because I'm with you. Paul in the New Testament has similar teaching and experience. If you look at the Philippians chapter 4, 11 and 12, Paul said that, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content. <laughs> content? Or it's way but the second verse. <coughs> Alright, here we go. 4, 11 and 12. Paul said, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what is to be in need and I know what it is to be have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want. <coughs> what Paul is saying is that Psalm 23.1 The Lord is my shepherd. This is what Paul is thinking when he's writing Philippians 4, 11 and 12. No matter in what circumstance you are in, and according to your own analysis, and according to your own expertise and experiences, you may think that you are insufficient in financial terms, in emotional terms, or in social terms, or in whatever terms. But Psalms 23.1 is saying to you that, my son and my daughter, you are sufficient right here and right now because I am your shepherd, because I am your Lord. But what we have to do to understand these deeper, as in more, more have a better understanding of this passage. I've been a Christian for 20 years, but I, I, I didn't really understand the, the, depth, the depth of this Psalm 23.1 until a few weeks ago. I was meditating on it for a long time. I was meditating, I was worshipping when I'm driving. I'm just thinking about Psalm 23.1 for, for a long, long time. That's why I'm preaching this for the last and this sermon. So what do we have to do to understand this? But let's read John, 20, John 21, 1 to 14. Anyone in UCB? Anyone study in UCB? Anyone else? UCB? Yeah. Can you come up and read John 21? <laughs> Give me a clap. <laughs> huh? Because I'm from UCD and UCD have the best people in there. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, UCD. Yay. Yeah, I, I, I give you this. Yeah, he's very loud. Be all right. He's a big, strong guy. So, John. 21, 1 to 14. You have heard this before, but I'm not preaching what you think I'm preaching. So pay attention. All right. Um, so John 21, verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also, also called Didymus, and Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw out your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciples, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. 
It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Thank you, Gabriel. See, you see the components. <laughs> Next time, Trinity. Wait, or oh, DIT, right? Next time I pick on DIT. So this passage here, we have read many times. The disciples arrived at the Sea of Galilee. And they are there. Oh, so loud. Why do they go there? Because Jesus commanded them to go. If you look at Matthew 28.10, Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. So the disciples, the 11 disciples, one gone, 11 left. They followed the command of Jesus and go there. And when they arrived, nothing seems to happen. And so some of the disciples decided to follow Simon Peter and began fishing again. And most of them are fishermen. So Jesus told them to go there. And they obeyed his command and they arrived. But when they arrived, the Bible didn't say how long. Obviously, I think for some time, they didn't see Jesus. So they don't know what to do. And for some reasons, they start fishing again follow Peter. How many of us have heard the phrase, do something, even if it is wrong? When you don't know what to do, when you are standing at a, at a junction, when you have to make a decision, then you don't know what to do. You have prayed to God and nothing seems to happen. You didn't hear any instructions from God. You go to Bible studies, you go to worship, go to service listen to the sermons, take notes, and after all that, nothing seems to stand out to answer your prayer. So how many of us heard the phrase, do something, even if it is wrong? The disciples didn't wait for the Lord's leading, and they went back to fishing. And these are committed Christians. These are people who preach and who share and who fight with Jesus. So the 11 disciples was in a situation where they may not have known exactly what to do. And according to the text, even though they follow the Lord's command into doing something, which is good, but in part two, they start doing their own things because they didn't see Jesus there. We are not told that when Peter has made this decision in returning to fishing. There are actually a good few people is on that boat. Peter was there. James was there. John was there. Thomas was there. These are the, like, super Christians in the New Testament. All these Christians are there. These are all the future church leaders. These are the people who died for God later on in the Bible. So all these super Christians, they all went onto the boat along with Peter. And the Bible said there's a few others. It wasn't named, so we don't know who is it. A pastor was from another church was preaching about this passage. And he asked his people, his congregation, he said, do you know or have you ever wondered who are these other disciples on the boat who are not named? And the pastor said, perhaps they are you and me on the boat. Brothers and sisters, if we don't know what to do in our life or in a specific situation, we don't know what options to take, we don't know what path to go, we don't know what attitude to adapt, at that turning point, in that moment in time, will you just follow what the others are doing? To make you secure and comfort instead of waiting for the leading of our Lord. I think we are just the same. We are following the crowd. We are following the norm. Even though that may not be the leading of the Lord, we want to follow the majority of people to do something, even though if that is wrong. But in that process, 
this false security generates because we are doing something. At least we are not hanging around or waiting. They are doing nothing. At least we are doing something. So in that process, it generates a false security for you to move on. This is what happened to the disciples. When Simon Peter has decided to go back to fishing, a lot of questions, including all the names I mentioned, Peter, James, John, and Thomas, these are all the stupid questions. These are all the people of good faith and big faith, and they serve God greatly later on in the Bible. They all follow Peter and went up to fishing. Why is that? Can you not suggest, can we just wait here and wait for Jesus? Because he asked us to come here, and let's wait for the Lord, let's wait for his guidance. The, the disciples may not have known they, they start, the disciples may know the area as in the Sea of Galilee, and they go back to fishing. But this is not a guarantee for success when they launch into doing something, if that is not the leading of the Lord. The men are on the water for the whole night, according to the Bible. And the outcome is, they got nothing. They have no fish. They caught nothing at all. They caught no fish at all. So what they want before the night, when they launch that little boat into the sea, they want to go fishing. And obviously, when you go fishing, you want fish, right? And after the whole night, and these how many people, close to 10 people on that boat, they got nothing at all. So they did not get what they want. They get nothing at all. And when we do things our own way, without God's leading and blessing, we shouldn't expect much in the results. And in that process, you generate a lot of want a lot of things occupies your mind that if I do this, I can generate this. And if I follow these steps, or if I follow these people, this is the result I want. But if that's not the leading of the Lord, we shouldn't be expecting much in the result. This is what the 11 disciples has, has learned, at least in this incident. But what the Bible said is that the disciples should not be lacking in anything. In Psalms 23, 1, that the Lord is my shepherd. If the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not be in want. But for some reasons, the 11 people is launching into the sea and they want some fish. They want to sell that for some money or what they want to fish for, I don't know. Or they want to go back to the fishing trade or they're just hungry, they want food, they go fishing. So I don't think they are just hungry. Because if you're just hungry, you, you won't stay there for, for that long. Other than fish, you can eat a lot of stuff. You can eat bread. <laughs> if you're fishing for one night, then you've got no fish. And if you're really hungry, just go back and eat some bread. There are plenty of food in Israel, apart from fish. So I don't think they are just simply as hungry. They are not just satisfying their need. As in, you need food, there's a need. But what they are doing on that boat is they are satisfying their want. They want a lot of fish for whatever reasons behind their head. You see what I mean? So they are trying to think about things they want and they are doing something without the guidance of the Lord, and they do it. And it generates no result. But what the funny thing is, Jesus was there when they were fishing. Jesus was right when and where they need him. Jesus was there right when and where they need him. This is the problem. When they are fishing for the whole night, and they got nothing, and a man was shouting, from the, the, the shore, the land, over to the boat, and say, cast your net over there. That means that they're not too far away. And when Peter knew that was Jesus, he put on his top and he jumped in and swam across back to Jesus. So Jesus wasn't far away at all. He is within shouting distance. He is within swimming distance. But what these people were experiencing is, they are hungry, they are tired, they are cold, they are frustrated. And they are not happy, even though Jesus is only shouting distance away. Jesus is really, really close to them. And all the promise and all the blessings Jesus can supply and provide, they miss the whole lot for some reasons. They want to do their own thing. Jesus is really, really close. Brothers and sisters, is that what you're feeling right now? You're feeling like... Like the disciples, that you put in a lot of effort into doing something, and somehow there's no result generates. And in the process, you got sad and you got frustrated, and you're just not happy. Like the disciples. But again, Jesus is so close to them, and yet 
they experience all these. And not experience Psalm 23, 2, 3, and 4. Lie down in green pastures and happy and comfortable and stuff like that. Nothing in Psalms 23, 2, 3, and 4 is appearing on the 11 disciples. But Jesus was there right when and where they need him. Are you consistently worried about things? I mean consistently, not just occasionally. You worry about the now and the future. What you want, you don't get it, and you got frustrated. And you are feeling insufficient. You are feeling that you are a failure. You are fe feeling that your emotion is very fragile, that you're going to break down any time. But the problem is, and the good, the good and the bad news is, Jesus was right there, right when and where you need him. It seems like that God is not leading you, and God is not blessing you anymore. But today, what I'm preaching today is, no matter what circumstance you're in, even though you're feeling insufficient or not, even though you're feeling yourself is rich, or you're healthy or you're not healthy or not, Jesus is here right when and where you need him, as in right now. So what Paul is saying in the New Testament that I have learned the secret to be content is this. No matter what situation you're in, Jesus is right here and right now. We need not to forget, forget the Lord is my shepherd. Psalms 23.1 Jesus is loving you because he died for you on the cross. And the Holy Spirit is always here to give you the power and the guidance you need for your life. And we shall not be in want. This is the secret of being content in any and every situation. In 21.9, there, that when they discovered that this is Jesus, Simon Peter jumped into the sea, swam across, and see Jesus. And the other disciples are kind of rowed the boat back to land. And when they land, they see this, 21.9. Can we put it up there, 21.9? When they land, they saw a fire. Are we here? Nine? Yeah, when they land, they saw a fire of burning coals. There were fish on it and some bread. When they're out for the whole night, they're cold, they're frustrated, they're tired, they're hungry. The first thing they see when they go back to the house is they see a charcoal of fire and there's some fish on it. The fire is for cooking and it's for welcoming. And Jesus deliberately was doing that. Jesus can cook and finish all the cookings. And when the moment they step into the door, he see fish on the plate and they can start eating. But the way Jesus is doing this is, he put a fire in the house and he put some fish and he put some bread on top of it. And there's some bread as well. Obviously the bread and the fish is for eating and the fire is for welcoming. There's fire, there's bread, and there's fish. These are the three elements the disciples are very familiar with. Because when they follow Jesus, when Jesus, before Jesus went on to the cross, all these things remind the disciples at the times when Jesus had provided for the people in need. So what Jesus is telling the disciples is, I'm going to provide your need. Remember Jesus feed the 4,000, the 5,000, and the many thousands of people using fish and bread. Every disciple was there helping Jesus doing that. They are giving out, they are, they are allocating the bread and the fish. So when the disciples see the fish and the bread, there's such a warmth that's in, in their heart. And they know it, and Jesus knew it. When you have experienced something, when you have followed someone, say your husband or, or your wife or something like that, and every time your husband or your wife say come back with something, or when he or she do something, you know what will happen next, and you know the meaning of it. You see what I mean? For the people who are in a relationship, you know. When your husband and when your wife do something, you know what is he thinking. You know what are the next two or three steps. And they give you warmth. They give you love. And they, they give you security. This is what Jesus is doing. He deliberately picked fish and bread. Because the many disciples that follow him, doing all the miracles, when they see fish and bread, it means God is supplying for all the people who are in need. And now Jesus is telling all the people, 
my disciples. I will supply, and I am supplying all the stuff you need. That's why Jesus got them fish and bread for breakfast. So they ate breakfast with Jesus, and they fellowship with him. They talk and talk and they share. And this, this, this is a very important feature about back in those days in the culture, that when you eat this fellowship meal with fish and bread, the, the, the food is kind of minor, but the intimate exchange and the friendship and the love and the caring exchange between the people, this is the, 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 the main aim of a fellowship dinner. So what Jesus is telling the disciple is, if you wait for my guidance, if you wait for my leading, if you remember, I am your shepherd. And if you just remember this, the Lord is my shepherd. And the result in your life and in your spirit is, I shall not be in want. No matter what circumstance you are in. And Jesus knew, what do you need today? And he wants to go into an intimate fellowship with you so that you can regain this trust and this security in the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. Do you think Jesus only cooked them breakfast because they got nothing? They got a tough night ahead uh, last night, so he just buy them a meal to make them happy? No, it wasn't like that at all. In God's plan, this meal is already all planned even before they launched the boat into the sea last night. This is already in God's plan. What does this tell us? Jesus is reminding everyone, well, I have said this many times, <laughs> I'm going to say it again, the Lord is my shepherd. L-O-R-D, Lord, Yahweh. The Lord is my shepherd. If the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not be in want. And your Christian life will arise, will rise to another level. That when you are facing difficulties, your emotions and your life won't be as impact as much. Your whole being will become solid. Your appearance will go into maturity, the way you're handling things. Instead of crying out for God, God, I need this, I need that, this is coming up, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. But this is still good, at least you're going to God for power, you're not going for anyone else for power. But if we understand Psalm 23.1, your faith will rise to another level. That you're not going to pray for, Lord, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. You're, going, you're still going to pray for this, but you're going to say less often. But instead, you will say, the Lord, you are my shepherd. I am safe. I am sufficient right now. And I will just do whatever is ahead of me in your name and in your power. If we do that, Psalms 23, verse 2 starts to kick in. But it, it only kicks in now. Don't kick in in your first step that, Lord, I need, I need this. No, no, no. The second step is this. If we have a knowledge, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23, 2 and 3. He will supply us an abundant life. This is what Psalm is talking about. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right path for his name's sake. God is leading you onto the right path. And this path is abundance. If we are willing to accept and we think we acknowledge the Lord is my shepherd, he will supply us with an abundant life. First of all, he also supplies every Christian a secure life. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comforted me. If we are acknowledging the Lord is my shepherd, he will give you an abundant life, verse 3. He will give you a secure life, verse 4. When you're walking through the darkest valley, God's rod, that means his power. His power is with you. The power of the Holy Spirit is with you. This is the same power who raised Jesus from the death. This power is with you. And he supplies all Christians a blessed and powerful life. This is Psalms 23.5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. 
Your cup overflows with abundance and power and blessing. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Why I shall not be in want? Because God is giving you an abundance life. Verse 2, God is giving you a secure life. Verse 4, and God is giving you a blessed and powerful life. Verse 5, this is the right way of reading Psalms 23. So, brothers and sisters, abundance, security, and blessings. This is what is God giving you today. And this is why you shall not be in want, because God is giving all these to you. And the good news is, this is not for later. According to the experience of Paul, this is not for later. This is for the right here and right now. So let's sing a song and respond to God. Very important message today, and I believe this will transform your life because it has, it has begun, it has started to transform my life, the way I pray, the way I see God, the way I exercise my faith, the way I ask for things from God. I believe the same power will transform your life. So let's bow down our head and we pray, and we sing this song to God and respond to His goodness. Thank you, Jesus, for your message. Thank you for giving us Psalm 23, 1 to 6. Lord, this is a powerful message. Lord, help me to pray to you, not just asking for things like Daniel, asking things from Ahoy. Lord, I, I don't want to do that all the time because this is, this is a child. This is immature. This is selfishness that we keep praying like that all the time. But instead, God, I'm willing to learn to acknowledge that, Lord, the Lord, you are my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Because you are giving me an abundant life, you are giving me a blessed and powerful life, and you are giving me all you can as a father to sons and daughters, that I shall not be in need, I shall not be worried about anything, because, Lord, you are saying that I am sufficient right here and right now. Thank you, Lord, for the promise. And let us respond to you and sing you this song. Thank you, Jesus. Stand. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. It has you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My Lord, defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Your grace is more Grace is found Grace where you are Where you are Oh Lord, I'm free Holiness is Christ in me We sing, Lord, I need you Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, we sing again, Lord, I need you.
lift my soul to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand or fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay teach my soul to rise to you teach my soul to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Jesus, thank you for your promise. Lord, you are my shepherd. You are the single essence of my life. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for looking after us. Lord, I just want to pray for people, pray for Christians here right now. Therefore, the people who want something really bad. You are thinking that you have a need, you have a want. To the point that you are ready to disobey God, to have that thing. I want to pray for you. The Lord is your shepherd. We shall not be in want. If you're wanting something really bad right now, and you're on the edge of disobeying God so that you can get it, I want to pray for you. I pray that the Holy Spirit will give you the power to return to your shepherd as we are sheep following our shepherd. He is guiding you. He is leading you. Give him, the, give him your life. You are secure in him. He is going to give you all the best things. He is going to give you all the best, all the abundance, all the power, all the blessings. Let's return to God. The Lord is my shepherd. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us this promise. Let us really clink into this promise of yours so that we can come to you with a faith that can rise above what you can supply, a faith that is based on an understanding of who you are, but not what you do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your powerful word today. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, the fellowship, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all forever. Amen.